Library, it's my privilege to welcome you um, to this book talk this morning. Um, we are very excited about this new partnership uh, with the uh, Emeriti Association. Um, we're having, can't hear in the back? No. Okay, we are on. I'll try and talk more into the mic. Can you hear? No? That's found the volume. Is that is that better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, we are we're very excited about uh, this partnership with the Maritime Association. Um, we uh, certainly are interested in reaching out to our friends and supporters in the community, and um, so this, this this relationship is is really special to us. We're very happy to have uh, this event here today. Um, this is a really very exciting time to be at Georgia State. I'm relatively new. I'm, I'm closing in on one year. I started December 1st last year, and um, I'm just thrilled to be here and thrilled to be a part of this story that's being told. Um, such a great location, downtown Atlanta. Um, the success that we're having with students right now is getting lots of national attention in the higher ed press. Um, our administrators are traveling around the country and we've had hundreds of institutions come here to find out about what's the secret, what's happening at Georgia State um, around student success. And the GSU Library plays an important part in that. Um, we're kind of quietly behind the scenes doing a lot to support students. And it's really exciting for me to be a part of that. Uh, we have more than 400 workstations. We have 100 laptops. We provide access to a world of information resources. And those are the tools that the students are using as they are being successful here at Georgia State. Um, so successful that we're kind of overwhelmed by the numbers. Um, la just, just looking at the st statistics, last month we had 23,000 unique visitors. In a, in a day, we might have 11 or 12,000 people enter the library. So um, we're in the midst right now of doing some master planning and saying, what does the future of the facility look like? We know we need to provide more space for our students. We also are an important part of supporting this research success that's happening here, the scholarship that's happening. Um, the number of dollars that the institution is bringing in in external funding has more than doubled in the last five years. And the scholarship that's being produced here is remarkable, and we're going to get a taste of that this morning. Um, so welcome. So glad to have you here. And now I get to introduce LaLaurie Kanata who is the librarian for the Andy Young School to introduce today's speaker. Hi. Professor Newman began his association with Georgia State University in 1970, serving in a variety of administrative positions, including assistant dean of the College of Urban Life and chair of the Department of Urban Studies. In 1975, he assisted in the preparation of a grant from the Kellogg Foundation that created what is now known as the Nonprofit Studies Program in the Andrew Young School. When the school was known as the Department of Public Administration and Urban Studies, I had the pleasure of taking the Intro to Urban Studies course under Professor Newman in, let's just say, the mid-90s. <laughs> uh, I believe the textbook was City Lights and is in the collection if you're looking for some late night reading materials. And it also asks for the discussion of Atlanta as a city. Uh, I also, of course, I'm a librarian, so I'm always promoting the collection there. I also have a list if you're interested in other books that discuss the city of Atlanta. So from 2008 to 2012, Professor Newman served as chair of the Department of Management, Public Management and Policy. He also has been active in public affairs in Atlanta, he served for 11 years as a member, too, as chair of the City of Atlanta's Urban Design Commission and as a member of the Mayor's Task Force on the Design of the Public Safety Building. Professor Newman was also a member of Congressman John Lewis's 5th Congressional District Multicultural Initiatives Task Force and served as a faculty member on the, public, on the Policy Institute for Civic Leadership. Since his retirement, he continues to teach the undergraduate policy leadership course with Dr. Mike Meskin and Dr. Andrew, Andrea Young. He volunteers as a member of the board of the Andrew J. Young Foundation and the GSU Emeritus High Association Coordinating Board. 
He directed the Andrew Young Legacy Project, which produced the film Andrew Young's Making of Martin Atlanta. I saw the film on PBS last fall, and, and I highly recommend it um, that you take a look after you read the book that you will discuss in a moment. Uh, I saw Professor Newman also during the summer on the fifth floor of the library this past summer and wondered what he was working on, and now I get to hear all about it. So please welcome Professor Harvey Newman to discuss his book, Andrew Young and the Making of Martin Atlanta. Thank you so much, LaLoria, and it is such a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, writing a book is what I would describe as a complex partnership, and that partnership obviously began with my co-authors, Ambassador Andrew Young, of course, and his daughter, Andrea Young. And so it was a labor of much love over the past six years to do the interviews, to do the writing, to do the editing, and all the rest that's involved in producing a volume such as the one we're here to talk about today. But partnerships also extend to a lot of other people who made this book possible. We received corporate support, we received foundation support, financial support from friends, and of course, indispensable in the process is the support of family. Um, my wife of 48 years, Patricia, is here, and I would acknowledge to everyone that this book would not have been possible without her. Uh, she would nudge me out of bed to go to the study mornings, every morning, to grind out my required number of pages for that day. And if that had not been possible, then you wouldn't have the book that we have today. Uh, also, student graduate research assistants played an invaluable role throughout the process. And so this was a close working partnership between the Andrew Young Foundation and the School of Policy Studies that also bears Ambassador Young's name. But other partnerships that made this possible I don't go to therapy except with my running group once or twice a week. And those two long-suffering emeriti partners who are here today, but I will mercifully not call them by name, had to listen to my stories and my frustrations and all the joys and experiences that went into the producing of this book and film. Uh, the film, by the way, will be shown again this time on WPBA 30 Atlanta on November 20th from 9 until 11. And I would also inject a commercial announcement, speaking of partnerships, to encourage you to buy the book. <laughs> My reason for encouraging this is not only do I think it's a pretty good book, but it would make an excellent holiday gift, and all of the royalties from this book go to a partnership with the Georgia State University Foundation. So we have signed over the royalties to the GSU Foundation uh, as a gesture of goodwill for all the support we received over the years. So uh, indeed, this book is a very great partnership between a lot of people. I mentioned Andrew Young because he is very much the focus of this book. Andrew Young is a master storyteller who talks in this book about his transition from rabble rouser civil rights leader to public official. And this transition throughout his career is a reflection of his remarkable leadership skills. As LaLoria mentioned, I have been teaching a leadership course in the Andrew Young School for the past 15 years, and one of my definitions of leadership is the ability to attract and to inspire and retain followers. And by that definition, 
Andrew Young is a remarkable leader. We had a book event a couple of weeks ago now, and a couple that we had interviewed came up to me, and they had their copy of the book in their hand, and they waved it in my face and said, you made a mistake on page whatever. And I said, oh, really? What was it? Please tell me. You said we met him in 1970. No, we met him in 1964. <laughs> so the next printing is going to have to correct that. But indeed, when he first ran for the US Congress in 1970, he began to make friends and followers who have continued to follow him to the present day. And these followers of Andrew Young have even adopted a name for themselves, Youngdom. And so I stand here before you as a recent addition to the followers of Andrew Young, Youngdom. But the book that we're here to talk about is the story of his contributions to the public life of our city of Atlanta, Georgia and its transition from a sleepy little southern town with segregation and fewer than a million people, uh, we didn't reach that threshold until 1960, to a metropolitan area that's now among the top 10 largest metropolitan areas in the U.S. of six and a half million people, I'm told. And the making of the city that you see spread out before you today is indeed the story of Andrew Young and his predecessors and those that he helped mentor to make this city what it is today. And one of the places that we began in the book is with a rather interesting bit of reflection about Atlanta, Georgia. If you think about it, there's no compelling reason for Atlanta to exist as a city. It's not on a lake, it's not on a riverfront or a port, and most cities throughout human history were built on a waterway, and yet we have no navigable waterway. We were instead built after the availability of new railroad technology, the so-called rivers of steel, as our early civic leaders described it. But Railroads and transportation took the place of the waterways that had caused cities to come into being in previous times. But it's an interesting thing to think about that what has created Atlanta, Georgia, is a series of very committed leaders who cared about making this city what it is and always aspiring to be something that we weren't. When we were a sleepy little mud hole in the 1840s and 50s, leaders set their sights on becoming an important place in the state of Georgia, a dream they didn't achieve until after they became the state capital following the Civil War. Then they set their sights on becoming a city of importance in the region, and it took a series of three cotton expositions in order to achieve regional prominence. And then early in the 20th century, they said, we can make this place a city of national importance. It took us until the 1960s and the leadership of then Mayor Ivan Allen to achieve that dream. And then no sooner had we done that, in 1970, I happened to be here and was watching the local news one evening, and our mayor at the time announced we were going to be the world's next great international city. And I admit, freely and willingly, I rolled on the floor laughing in the living room. The very idea of Atlanta being an international city was crazy to me. Was I wrong? And the reason I was wrong is because I underestimated the leadership that this city would have the leadership that sought and achieved an Olympic bid, then put on the Olympic Games in 1996, that forever stamped us as a place to be taken seriously on the world stage. 
So we are a city that has always wanted to promote itself as a place of importance and having a willingness to roll up our sleeves and work hard to make those dreams come true. And that's a remarkable transition in just a few short decades from sleepy segregated southern town to the international place that we enjoy today. And that is the story of Andrew Young and the making of modern Atlanta. And throughout the book, what we discovered from our earliest conversations is that everyone spoke of a distinctive Atlanta way, a way of doing things in this city that was somehow different from the way business was conducted in other places. And so, in more than 60 interviews, and by the way, the partnership that uh, we've established with this university and this library will continue as all of our archival materials are being turned over, both our audio and video interview footage, so that future generations of scholars who want to know about how we came to create this city will have access to this material. But we ask each one of our more than 60 audio interview subjects, what is the Atlanta way? And we began to get answers along this line. It was a partnership, a coalition between elected public officials of the city of Atlanta and business leaders and African-American citizens in this community. And this partnership is attributable to a remarkable mayor, William B. Hartsfield. Mayor Hartsfield is the city's longest serving mayor, and although he was a rather paternalistic um, segregationist and a lot of other things, he was also a very astute politician. And he recognized that in 1946, the U.S. Supreme Court issued a ruling that required the state's Democratic primary to allow African Americans to vote. And it resulted in what he knew would be a new wave of citizens participating in local elections. And when later that year, he had a visiting delegation of African American leaders that included people like Daddy King, John Wesley Dobbs, when they came in to see Mayor Hartsfield, they said, we would like you to desegregate the police force. Police brutality had been an issue in this city for many, many decades, and this was seen as an opportunity to change the pattern of behavior by the city's police force by hiring African American officers. In 1946, this was not to be thought of in the South, in any other place. And rather than reject this question out of hand, Mayor Hartsfield issued a challenge. If you will register 15,000 voters, I will hire African Americans on the Atlanta Police Department. Two years later, 1948, they came back for another visit with the mayor. This time he said, what have you done? And he said, the leader said, we have registered 18,000 voters in this city in less than two years' time. Mayor Hartsfield kept his part of the bargain and hired eight African-American police officers. There was a lot wrong with the picture, and we don't deny that. But when you stop and think about it, it was more than 20 years before another major city in the Southeast hired African-Americans on their police force. And this was a symbol of the Atlanta way, the way in which African-American leaders expressed their needs and their desires, and the way public leadership responded to that with the cooperation of the city's business leadership. 
It's a coalition of people who were able to get things done. The desegregation of the police department was merely the first step. From that day forward, this Atlanta Way coalition was able to build new airport terminals, new airport runways to keep us ahead of transportation needs of this city in this region. The old joke that to get to heaven from Birmingham you have to change planes in Atlanta certainly summed up the way our neighbors to the west felt about our airport in Atlanta. What's less well known is our designation as an important regional airport depended on the insight, the vision, and hustle, if you will, of Mayor Hartsfield and others. The Federal Ad Aviation Administration wanted to build the aviation route from New York City to Miami, routing it through Birmingham, of all places. And our leaders said, come on down to Atlanta, they met the FAA official at the airport, gave him a ticker tape trade to a downtown hotel, and put him up in great luxury for his visit to Atlanta. And the next week, we were named the airmail route from, New, from Miami to New York. And that stopover and the runways that needed to be built, the terminal facilities, all made us the center of aviation for the Southeast. And I don't have to remind you that we now have Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport always in the top one or two as the busiest airport in terms of the number of takeoffs and landings and passengers who pass through on an annual basis. So the Atlanta Way has in fact been able to accomplish incredible things to create the city that we know it to be. The strength of the coalition are its ability to get things done. In the promotional materials for this event, I wrote a short piece that has been reproduced some other places that describes how the Lakewood Amphitheater was built in South Atlanta. And that, again, was a partnership between Mayor Andrew Young, the city's business leaders, and the local community there in the surrounding area of Lakewood. But that was the kind of deal that everybody stood to benefit from. Local communities were hired to do parking, do security, do concessions, t-shirts, souvenirs, all of those things are controlled by neighborhood residents who live in the Lakewood area. This was one of our city's lowest income neighborhoods, very hard hit by the closing of the automobile factory in south, southwest Atlanta. So this is the kind of win-win that the Atlanta Way has made possible. I mentioned the Olympic Games. Again, this was a very complex partnership. When Billy Payne had the original idea that Atlanta should make a bid for the Olympics, he went first to the Chamber of Commerce and their executive committee. And each member of that executive committee put up personally $1,000 to form the seed money to go into the bid effort for the Olympic Games. From that initial partnership and sponsorship, Billy went to see Andrew Young. Mayor Young thought, this guy's crazy. We can't host the Olympics. But in the course of the conversation, Billy Payne convinced Andrew Young that we could do it. And how it was done is a story that I enjoyed telling in the book that we're talking about and celebrating today. Now, one of the things that we observed about this Atlanta Way and this long-standing black-white coalition in our city is that it's a process that must be reformed and maintained over time. 
There is no guarantee at any moment that this Atlanta Way coalition will be able to continue. And so, over the course of the city's history, there have been a number of challenges to the Atlanta Way. The election of Maynard Jackson in 1973 is certainly one of those events that posed a challenge to the traditional way of doing things in the city of Atlanta. When Ivan Allen was mayor of Atlanta, when his predecessor Bill Hartsfield was mayor, if a business leader, predominantly white at that time, wanted something from City Hall, all he, most of them were men at the time, had to do was pick up the telephone and contact the mayor, someone they had known all of their lives. And that personal relationship was missing when Maynard Jackson was elected mayor. He was not one of the good old boys, and very quickly he let it be known that the old ways of doing business that had defined the partnership would be very different from that point forward. And so when he got ready to build the expansion of the airport, the new terminal building and so on, he said to the business community, 20 to 25 percent of every contract involved in this airport will be given to minority or joint venture contractors. When he took office in 1974, less than one half of one percent of all the city's contracts in a majority African American city, less than one half of one percent went to minority contractors. And he said this just is fundamentally unfair. And so this was something he was determined to change. We didn't even have a term for this process, and he used the term minority business development. We didn't have affirmative action until a few years later. But what he insisted upon, the business community thought was not going to work at all. And he was not just talking about moving dirt on the runways or paving contractors. He was talking about the design, the architects, the bankers who were going to finance it, the attorneys, everyone who did business with the city would be subject to this joint venture minority contracting requirement. This did not make Maynard Jackson the most popular mayor like his predecessors. Reaction was pretty harsh, and the newspaper publicly proclaimed that Ivan Allen's tenure as mayor had been Camelot compared to what the city was facing with a mayor that was perceived as anti-white. But Maynard Jackson held his ground. He said grass will grow on the runway before construction starts without the minority contracting requirements. And so he delayed the construction more than a year. And finally his staff, in meeting after meeting, and we interviewed his staff members who said it took all of our patience to convince business leaders that they needed to comply with this request. As you move around Atlanta, you don't see buildings named after Maynard Jackson, except for one high school. You don't see statues of Maynard Jackson. We just have not honored him because many of our business leaders felt that he was not part of the Atlanta way of doing business. And so when his two terms as mayor were up, a very unwilling Andrew Young had returned to Atlanta after being elected to three terms in Congress and having served Jimmy Carter as ambassador to the United Nations. 
Andrew Young returned to Atlanta and was urged to run for mayor. He looked at the audience that evening where they were asking him to run, and he said, I can't afford that. Pays $55,000 a year. I've got three children in college. Uh, just not going to work for me to be the mayor of Atlanta. One elderly African-American woman walked up to him, shook her cane in his face and said, we've wasted our time on you, and walked out of the meeting. <laughs> and he said he realized he needed to run for mayor. And when he ran, business leaders, except one, assumed that he would be a continuation of what they had come to know under Maynard Jackson. Every other business leader said, we are supporting his white opponent in that first election. Andrew Young persisted and won the election as mayor of the city. He asked his one white business leader who supported him, call a meeting, let's sit down and talk. And so after Tuesday's election on Friday, they held a meeting of some 50 or 60 CEOs of major corporations in the city. And the mayor stood up and mayor elect stood up in front of that group and said, I know you didn't vote for me, but I was elected without your support, but I can't govern this city without your help. And he went on to say, if I make a mess of this job, it's a $55,000 a year job. I can go away and get me a better job. But in the process, this city will be in a lot worse shape because you have investments in this city. So please work with me. And from that point on, Andrew Young as mayor began to reforge the partnership with the city's white business leaders. By that time, there were a budding cadre. Maynard used to say he had created 20 African-American millionaires in Atlanta. But in truth, Maynard Jackson had begun a process of what I call changing the opportunity structure for African-American businesses in this city. The streets were not always paved with gold. And as we'll talk about in a minute, there were problems with the Atlanta way in always doing the things that they should or the things that they wanted to do. But nevertheless, Maynard Jackson deserves an enormous credit for being willing to take the criticisms, to forge ahead on a path that he knew to be correct. When Andrew Young took office, he said, oh, by the way, the minority business employment requirement will increase to 35%. People didn't object. <laughs> By then, eight years after Maynard Jackson had introduced it, this was part of the Atlanta way now. And so it became a much more acceptable way of doing business. When the Olympic bid was approved, minority contracting requirement went up to 40 percent. This time the business leaders, white business leaders, says, enough. That's way too much. Andrew Young looked at him and said, 60 percent of a growing pie is better than 100 percent of nothing. And they were convinced they could settle for 60 percent of a growing pie in a growing city. So the Atlanta way has been helpful in not only expanding economic opportunity for all citizens or most citizens in Atlanta, but it has been able to get things done in Atlanta, Georgia. But I would be remiss if I didn't say there weren't weaknesses in the Atlanta way and the coalition that has made things possible. First of all, it's not always easy to include low-income citizens. Um, I have spent much of my professional career 
working with low-income neighborhoods in the city of Atlanta and helping them with their economic development programs. And I confess, Ambassador Young and I joke about it, I never supported any of his programs for the eight years that he was mayor. We disagreed on almost every policy matter that he put forth. But I also add I voted for him twice because he was a great human being. And I had respect and admiration for what he was trying to do. Now, with the benefit of many years past, I have a somewhat more positive appraisal of why he was doing what he was doing when he was mayor of our city. He didn't have the financial support from the federal government that has existed during the 1970s. I tell him the story that when I was hired here early in the 1970s, one of my first jobs was to write grant proposals for the School of Urban Life. And I, every grant proposal, we'd send it to Washington and they would fund it. And so I thought I was God's gift to grant writing. I never had one turned down until I sent one to City Hall when Andrew Young was mayor, and I learned rejection. <laughs> and I learned later that the spigot of federal aid from the federal government directly to cities had run out around 1980, about the time that Andrew Young was elected. And as a consequence, he had to look for other sources of revenue to support the programs that were important to the city. And that was very difficult to do at the time. One of the other things that I would say about the Atlanta Way, and it is a subtext in the book, is that there are complex social problems that affect our city that the Atlanta Way is not particularly good in solving. One of those that is discussed throughout this book is the reduction of poverty. We simply have not been able to reduce or in any way move toward the elimination of the large percentage of our population in the city of Atlanta who live below poverty standards. Again, I would go back to the phrase that I used Maynard and Andrew Young changed the opportunity structure of the way of doing business with the city. It enabled many, many more African Americans and other minorities, including female-owned firms, to do business with the city. And this provided many, many jobs for many, many people. But it also made Atlanta a magnet for people who came here, oftentimes without the education or the talent, to take advantage of the expanding economy in our city. One of the other problems that we don't spend a lot of time discussing, but it's well known to most of you in this audience, I'm sure, is that the Atlanta Way has had a difficult time with public education in our city. Chamber of Commerce has tried to lend its support to improving the Atlanta public schools, and many of those efforts have not been successful. But in spite of the strengths and the weaknesses of the Atlanta Way, this is a book that tries to celebrate some of the successes that we have had as a city along the way. And one of the things that I found particularly delightful was interviewing leaders from Birmingham, New Orleans, and other cities and getting their reflections on Atlanta in comparison with their own cities. And what we heard over and over is that beginning with the Atlanta student movement in the 1960s, Atlanta solved its desegregation problems in a relatively peaceful fashion, particularly in comparison with either New Orleans or Birmingham. And that made a difference in the willingness of businesses outside Atlanta 
to invest in this city. And so one of the things that uh, we turned our attention to at the conclusion of the book is what are some of the lessons of the making of modern Atlanta. And as I said, each one of our interviews included that question, what is the Atlanta way? And over the course of our research, we found that the city has what we call core competencies, two things that set Atlanta apart from places like Birmingham and New Orleans. First, our transportation history. We are a transportation city, have been from the beginning. Initially railroads, federal highways came through here early in the history of highway construction and paving, aviation in the late 1920s. Now transportation is including ideas as we become a center for CNN News and the development of the superstation by a communications genius, Ted Turner. We enjoyed the process of learning about this newest communication, transportation role for our city, competence if you will. We were fortunate enough to interview Mr. Turner. It was an unforgettable experience. Um, he sang to us. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> um, we asked him why he bought the Braves, and he said he'd have made more money if he'd bought the Yankees, and then burst into the theme song from Damn Yankees. So um, he's an interesting personality. We were also able to interview another person who has quietly helped the communications industry in our city to be a beacon of progressive influence on Atlanta and the Southeast. We sat down with one of the most gracious people I've ever met, Ann Cox Chambers. Um, she and her family, beginning with her father, own Cox Communication Company, which owns the AJC and so many other uh, communications and media outlets in this city. And hearing her talk about her father's relationship with Ralph McGill was an incredible story. Um, growing up in North Carolina, I was a huge fan of Ralph McGill because our local paper published his editorials every week. And people in Atlanta got to read them every day. And growing up with those editorials, it made me think of Atlanta as a place of progressive leadership of having a person who was courageous enough to say what needed to be said in the face of hatred and violence in the form of the temple bombing that we all know about. These were the kinds of things that Ralph McGill's leadership as editorial writer for the Atlanta Constitution made possible. And so we have had two strong elements that we call core competencies that our city needs to continue to encourage and to cultivate. Transportation, not just of people and goods, but of ideas, and tolerance. We take very much for granted the contributions and the work and the life of Martin Luther King, Jr., and yet, for many, many people around the world, when they think of Atlanta, they think of Martin Luther King, Jr. And how many times do we drive by the gravesite on Auburn Avenue and not think about the fact that here is one of the most remarkable human beings that has ever existed on planet Earth, and he called Atlanta home. One of the remarkable interviews we had was with a woman named Emma Darnell. Uh, some of you are smiling as if you know 
Emma's reputation. She served as the attack person for Maynard Jackson when he was doing, she was director of the Office of Contracts and Compliance. So she was right on the firing line when Maynard Jackson was trying to build the airport and get joint venture participation. She has now served for many terms on the Fulton County Commission. But when we ask her what makes Atlanta different, what makes Atlanta way work, she said these words that I will read to you now. We have folks coming here from all over the world. It's an intangible something here that is basically something spiritual. I believe that as long as we have it, we'll always be different and we'll always be stronger and we'll always survive. You know, it's not the skyline, it's not the Olympics, it's not the Falcons nor the Aquarium. It's that grave down there on Auburn and what it represents. And I thought that was a remarkable description of what has helped make Atlanta what it is. There are many other factors. The need to continue to build and maintain the coalition now made much more challenging by multiculturalism and ethnic diversity. But this coalition that has been at the heart of the Atlanta way needs to include businesses, philanthropy, diverse race and marginalized groups, and people interested in topics like parks, the environment, culture, and yes, historic preservation. One of the other lessons from the making of modern Atlanta is that local leadership matters. And we ought to continue a process that has gone on for a long, long time in our city. Mentoring. Each generation has taken the time to mentor the next generation, to make it accept its responsibility to be part of the Atlanta way. One of the stories that we stumbled on in doing our interviews was the fact that Herbert Jenkins, the longtime police chief under Mayors Hartsfield and Allen, Mayor Jenkins took the time to take a white officer that he thought a lot of, a good old country boy named Morris Redding, and send Morris out to meet with the student demonstrators from the Atlanta University Center. And so, almost daily, Morris Redding would go and meet with the student leaders and talk to them about what their plans were. He gained their trust. Uh, he would talk with Chief Jenkins and he would get back to the students and say, maybe it's not a good idea to march down this street because the Klan's going to be holding their counter demonstration there. If you'll move one street over, you'll be fine. And so even the student movement leaders that we interviewed attested to the remarkable leadership of Morris Redding and Chief Jenkins. And that torch of leadership was passed on when Andrew Young became mayor. Guess who he picked to be chief of police for the city of Atlanta? Morris Redding. And Morris took some of his younger officers aside, a young man named George Turner, and he said, I want you to serve on it. Mayor Young's security detail. And so for the next four or five years, George Turner drove him around, attended meetings with him, and got, as he said, a crash course in leadership and the Atlanta way. Along the way, Morris Redding also promoted Beverly Harvard to the first position as deputy chief for an African-American female in the city of Atlanta. When Bill Campbell was elected mayor, he made Beverly Harvard his chief of police. And so this mentoring torch was passed from Chief Jenkins to Morris Redding and on down to Beverly Harvard. And now Kasim Reed has appointed George Turner, who serves as his chief of police. 
And so this process has worked not just at business organizations, but also in the political level and now in uh, civil servants who work for the city in a variety of capacities. And this process of mentoring is vital to the continuation of the Atlanta Way. Another lesson from the Atlanta Way is the need to pair economic growth with expanded opportunities for disadvantaged communities. That has got to continue to be a hallmark of the Atlanta Way. When we did interviews, we not only interviewed the rich and the famous, but we interviewed people, frankly, I'd never heard of. And late one afternoon, we had done another interview or two that day, and I was tired, didn't want to do one more that afternoon. It was with a woman I'd never heard of. We went over to her office on the other side of uh, Hurt Park over there. We sat down. This was a wizened, elderly African-American woman sitting behind a huge desk. Her name was Rita Samuels. And we got to talking with Rita. And she looked at me, kind of sensing that I wanted to be someplace else. And she said, how many people have you interviewed who came to Atlanta as a 17-year-old girl from her hometown in rural Georgia and went to work as secretary for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference? And then when Jimmy Carter was elected governor of Georgia, she went to work for the state of Georgia as a personal assistant for Jimmy Carter. And she followed him to Washington when he was elected president. And so she turned to me and said, how many folks do you know have worked for two Nobel Peace Prize winners? I said, you're it. <laughs> and then we asked her the question, what is the Atlanta way? And she thought for a second. She put her hands together and she said, the Atlanta way is connecting the right people. And I wanted to make that somehow the title of the book. <laughs> because that is exactly what has characterized Atlanta, Georgia. It's been an exciting six years working on this project. I'm delighted to be able to share the results with you. Be happy to entertain questions. Have I answered everything? Yes, sir. Do uh, you have uh, Herman Russell in the group? Oh yes, Herman has made invaluable contributions and is probably one of those 20 millionaires that Maynard Jackson helped to create. Now one of the things that we do note is that before affirmative action was required with the city, Herman Russell had formed a partnership with John Portman to help the construction of Peachtree Center. And so he was on his way toward that first million long before he was able to do work on the Atlanta airport and with the concessions that made him an extraordinarily wealthy man. He also set history here in another remarkable way. He was the first African-American owner of a professional sports franchise in America. He was part owner of the Hawks and Flames. And that's a remarkable achievement when you think about how rare that is today. So Herman Russell's a very important figure. We were able to interview him before his death. So with the growth of metropolitan Atlanta, like you described, the six and a half million people, and with things happening like the Braves escaping to Cobb County and the breakdown in the regional transportation that you can't get all these counties together, is Atlanta Metropolitan Atlanta too big for the Atlanta way to exit, to keep, to continue? I guess another way of looking at your question is, is the Atlanta way applicable to a metropolitan scale? And I would answer that by saying, I hope so. Because I think we need to address problems like transportation, air quality, and so many other water supply that are indeed not city of Atlanta challenges, but metropolitan problems. And I think if I had to put my finger on one of the weaknesses of Atlanta as a metropolitan area, 
it is the lack of a structure, if you will, a governing structure that makes conversation addressing metropolitan scale problems more easily not only discussed but acted on. Um, two of my former students are sitting here on the second row. They've probably heard me talk about this because I've been talking about it in urban policy classes for many years. If you look at Johnson Ferry Road when it comes down out of Cobb County and crosses the Fulton County line, it goes from about eight lanes to, what is it, two? And that's been a traffic bottleneck for probably long before you were students in my class. <laughs> and I don't know that there's an easy solution to that. Fulton has very little incentive to widen the road on our side of the line. Cobb keeps saying, please. And Fulton keeps ignoring that plea. And there is no umbrella avenue other than the state to really address that. So that's a challenge for the city. And, and quite frankly, I would say one of the things that poses a real challenge to us is that our core competence of transportation is one in which we are falling behind on. I'm heartened by the positive vote last week. Maybe that's one of the few votes we can be heartened by, but uh, maybe I shouldn't say that either. But anyway, um, it's the, the local approval of that T-splost, I think, is going to be very important for the future of the city. Um, I'm hopeful we can move forward with things like that on a metropolitan scale, but it is very, very difficult um, and, and presents a challenge for Atlanta's leadership to work together. Yes, ma'am? What role did Coca-Cola play in this whole uh, spectrum? Coca-Cola played an enormous role, and they are not neglected in the book, to be sure. Um, it was often said that um, Mayor Hartsfield never made a decision without consulting uh, the head of the Coca-Cola company for more than 50 years, Mr. Robert Woodruff. And when you talk about a partnership between business and elected public officials, that Coca-Cola partnership with Mr. Woodruff was just exemplary. Um, during the Great Depression of the 1930s, the city literally could not make payroll. It had no money to pay its employees. Coca-Cola helped the city issue script to city employees that they would help cash so that city workers continued to be paid. When Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis, Robert Woodruff called Ivan Allen, who was then serving as mayor, and he said, Ivan, for the next week, until that funeral, Atlanta, Georgia is going to be the center of the world's attention. Do whatever you need to do to make sure we handle that event properly. If you need any resources, we stand behind you to provide them. And that's the kind of citizenship that the Coca-Cola company has exercised. And we hope other companies learn from their example and imitate that and be good citizens as well. Yes, sir. What the role of Marga, plus and minus? Um, it was a very important accomplishment, and it enabled us to host, first, the Democratic National Convention would not have met here if we hadn't had it in place. And certainly the Olympics would not have approved our bid had we not had that transportation link from the airport to downtown. So even though most of us recognize that it's a system that doesn't serve a six and a half million metropolitan area, it still is critically important in moving people around this city. And if there's the next step that we need to take, it is expanding uh, rail transit in some fashion. Uh, 
whether it's light rail trolleys like we've stuck our toe in the water with. Um, I'm not sure I'm convinced that's where we need to be, but I'm not a transportation expert. But MARTA has played a really important role in the city's growth and development. And certainly, I haven't mentioned his name today, but Sam Massell deserves a lot of credit for being mayor and putting a referendum forward that was approved by the voters of DeKalb and Fulton counties. Uh, Ivan Allen, for all of his leadership skills, failed when the first MARTA referendum was voted on. And Macell came forward, and if, if we look back to the Macell tenure as mayor, those four years, one term, um, certainly we would have to say that the MARTA approval of that bond referendum was certainly a, a key step in our city's growth. He, he told a really funny story. He said he rented a helicopter and flew over the downtown connector during rush hour traffic. And he would speak on the loudspeaker from the helicopter saying, if you're tired of being stuck in traffic, vote for Marta. <laughs> he said the people in their cars thought it was God talking to them. And they voted. <laughs> yes, sir. You've dealt with poverty in poor neighborhoods in your career. When Flint, Michigan had their water problem, it was said that North Flint did not have any grocery stores. Is there, are there regions in Atlanta where neighborhoods have no decent grocery store? I think the term is food deserts, and yes. Uh, unfortunately, some of the low-income neighborhoods in the city have those challenges. Uh, one of them is the area of Summerhill, um, which I'm amazed at how many people know neighborhood names and how many people don't. Summerhill is the neighborhood that immediately surrounds Turner Field. And one of the things that the neighborhood has consistently said, whatever you do when you redevelop Turner Field, we want a grocery store. <laughs> so I think that's a major initiative that needs to be built by this university and its partners as we move forward. The former president of Whole Foods is now devoting his life to uh, making grocery stores in poor neighborhoods. You might want to get in contact with okay. him. Okay, that'd be a good, good suggestion. It has been a pleasure to be with you today and uh, I see our host standing up, and that usually means he's ready to, for me to be quiet. I'm Harry Dangle, the, the current chair of the governing board of the Emeriti Association. So uh, on behalf of the board, I'd like to thank Harvey, who also sits on the board, and just share a, a couple real brief comments. Uh, those of us who run with Harvey on a weekly basis <laughs> have marveled at the stories as we, we heard about who was being interviewed and the variety of people that he talked to. You relieved a lot of pain because you took our minds off our legs and our lungs <laughs> as we heard your adventures. Um, Six years is a long time, but I'd like to reflect just real briefly because for most of us who have come out of an academic career, the contribution of this book is amazing. When you stop and think about it, an outsider could write a history of Atlanta, but it wouldn't include the voices of the people who lived it. And some of those voices are already silent, many are fading away. And to have those voices and that resource in our library where future scholars can listen and hear the Atlanta way, I, I think is, is a critical gift mm -hmm. that you've given. Um, and I couldn't help thinking about the university and looking at the students who were here attending the, the talk and the role that they and we have 
in moving the Atlanta way further. Um, so, on behalf of the Ameritide Association, thank you. And we look forward to one brief anecdote. So we were running yesterday. <laughs> And Harvey said, no, I talked to a man who was the athletic director for Atlanta Public Schools. And what he tells is how when it was clear that segregation was ending, the coaches of school, high schools in Atlanta got together unbeknown to the authorities and kind of planned out how were we going to address having white schools and black schools compete against one another. And so there was a grassroots <coughs> talking, collaborating, and working out some of those details, which when the day came, went much more smoothly. I, I think the, the moral of the story is there are, are parts of this that are still to be told, and more and more information to shed light on in terms of the Atlanta way. Thanks for coming today. And uh, there are books available in the back, and you'll be available to sign books. So those of you who uh, feel that's something you want to do, Harvey will be in the back. They make great gifts. <laughs> <laughs>